On this Wednesday installment of Locked On Texans, Brandon K. Scott and myself will be discussing whether or not it was a good idea for the Houston Texans not to make a move during the NFL trade deadline. You are Locked On Texans, your daily Houston Texans podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this Monday installment of Locked On Texas. As always, I'm your host, Cody M. Davis, and joining me today for, I guess, the remix installment of Locked On Texas is Mr. Brandon K. Scott from Sports Radio 16. Brandon, what's going on, man? Man, I'm glad to be joining you on a remix edition, remix installment on the Locked On Texas podcast and on a I guess kind of special important day, but not really because nothing really happened, but we're going to talk about it anyway. Yes, sir. And I guess, you know, in a way that you say not really important, which over the last couple of years, given the fact that the Houston Texans have been sellers at the deadline, I think it's safe to say for the very first time, we are a little bit happy that the Texans Kind of was on the quiet end during the NFL trade deadline, and that is what we're going to get into today. But, ladies and gentlemen, before doing all of that, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sports book of the NFL. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on today to get started. And we're going to start today's podcast with a recap, I guess, in a sense, of the Houston Texans trade deadline, because for the very first time in like what two years, the the Houston Texans, not only did they not do anything, but they was quiet throughout the whole entire day. B. Scott, let's jump right into it. Do you think this was the right decision for the Texans to not do anything for the trade deadline? Yeah, man, the hardest part about answering that question is always just not knowing exactly what was in front of them. Mm -hmm. Not knowing exactly how aggressive they were and not knowing exactly how attainable certain things would have been. Now, I do feel pretty comfortable saying that the Texans were not super aggressive in this trade market mm -hmm. or at the trade deadline. I don't feel like they would have been in the running for some of the moves that we saw. Like, I don't think they were in the market for Chase Young, even though everybody across the league who's not, I guess, not a 49ers fan, not a San Francisco mm -hmm. 49ers <laughs> fan. It's like... Why couldn't my team have given up a third round pick for Chase Young? I want I Chase know, Young right? too. <laughs> and I and I get that that envy and that everybody across the league, most teams, a lot of fan bases across the league feel that way, the Texans included. But it's hard to say that they didn't get it right or that they made a mistake or or anything like that without knowing exactly what was in front of them. What I think it says, what I think it illustrates to us is that two things. One, I don't think that they, and this is fair on their part, so I would agree with them on this. Mm -hmm. I don't think that they feel like they're like a player away or a trade deadline move away from going from here to there, going from what they've been to what they are right now to what they're trying to be. What they've been is bad. What they are right now is mediocre, and what they're trying to be is great eventually. I don't feel like, and I'm sure they don't feel like, that they're a, a trade deadline move away from making that happen. Now, does that mean that Chase Young for a third wouldn't have been nice or that or, <laughs> or that Montez would? I know he went for a second, and that probably was a little bit more, a, a little bit steeper of a climb. But, I mean, no, it, it definitely makes you look around when you see some of the moves that were made and like, man, I wish my team could do that. But you don't know that your team could have done that. It's not necessarily true that just because – this guy went for this to this team that your team could have had him for the same thing or could have had him at all for that matter. So it's hard to say without knowing exactly what was transpiring behind the scenes, but, but through, through not making any moves to me, it tells me that they realize that they're not just a player away, but mm -hmm. also that they really do legitimately like what they have in front of them on the roster. And when Cody, when you go to these press conferences, as I do, and you hear them, they don't say this exactly, but they talk a little bit about process over results or, or talk mm -hmm. about not being able to control the results or control the winning, just the process that goes into it. 
I feel like they actually believe in that. And the lack of moves at the trade deadline is indicative of that to me. Hmm. You know, B. Scott, I, I, I look at this from two ways. One, I'm not going to lie. Got caught up in the whole, the enter in the bye week, three and three. They were at the time was seven, sitting at the seventh spot for the wild card spot. And it's like, okay, maybe just maybe if they go out there and make the correct move at the deadline, it might be enough to push them over the edge so they can really make a run to the playoffs. However, the one thing that I kept going back to is, look, regardless of how fun the first six, seven games of the season has been, Regardless of how good CJ Stroud has looked, regardless, regardless how good a lot of these position groups, especially at wide receiver, has really exceeded the subpar expectations that they came into the season with, I kept going back to one thing. The, the, the Houston Texans are still in the early stages of a rebuild. They are not at square one, but they are at least at square two or three, or let, let's say two and a half, because there are moments where you can say, okay, they have definitely made progress in their rebuilds. But then there's games like the Carolina Panthers where you go out there and think to yourself, yeah, they are still in the early stages of the rebuild. And those draft picks can definitely be probably be worth something more in, in the long haul, especially when you consider that you already got your head coach and you already have your quote-unquote franchise quarterback. And I think once you have those two things locked down, you could really utilize those draft picks a lot more in terms of filling out the roster with prospects that can definitely come in and actually help this organization, not just for the now, but of course for the future. Now, with that being said, Big Scott, on yesterday's show, John and myself, we talked. And I said the one thing that I would like for the Houston Texans to do, if there was an opportunity for them to do so, is go out there and make a trade for a more experienced center. Because, look, Jerry Patterson, he was playing really, really well before he went down with that leg injury. You already know what's going on with Scott Quisenberry. He's out for the season. And then we're still trying to figure out what in the world is going on with Drew Scrubs? We thought without a shadow of a doubt that he was going to be on the shelf for at least the first four games of the season. And B. Scott, you was right next to me when Coach D'Amico Ryan talked about it on Monday when he said, we'll see when asked about the potential return of Drew Scrubs. I'm getting the sense that he is definitely not going to be on the practice field later on today. Yeah, so I... I I think that that's interesting for me, honestly, man. It's like more, more trays to fix the offensive line. Like at some <laughs> point, you just got to deal with the hand that you've been dealt. And it might just be time for Michael Deirdre to really just earn his his, his paycheck. And then not, not to say yeah, that he sure. hadn't been doing it in practice and all of that. But like, but it, it's, it's time to really come and earn this game check because they need you now. Like, Think about it like this, and I was going to make this point earlier too, Cody. And I'm glad you mentioned that that the thing that you wanted was is a center in in the, in the trade market at the trade deadline. Mm -hmm. Man, let's not forget that they have already made a handful of trades for this team, for this offensive line, I should say, on this team already. Starting back in March with the Shaq Mason trade that they made. Uh, made that trade and then it gave him the three-year extension on top of it so that's a heavy investment maybe not the what you traded for him but but the fact that you traded for him and then paid him heavy investment and then they go and trade these later round picks later on once you get to training camp and, and guys start to get injured they trade for josh jones mm -hmm. they trade for kendrick green you know so like i mean that's that's two moves just since training camp just since we got back in the fall or late summer, early fall, or late summer, early fall, where they're trading to, to, to plug the holes in the offensive line. And then th those guys start for you a little bit and then they get hurt, you know? And, <laughs> oh and so God. at what point, and then on top of that, we're talking about the often the most expensive offensive line in the NFL to begin with. So I don't know, Cody, man, like I, I get your concern. Mm -hmm. I understand a hundred percent. But at what point, I mean, <laughs> trade, for, tra trade something for another center and he get hurt too. Like, it's it's just time to start to to, to really start making it happen. If anything, uh, if, I mean, if anything, I, I feel like they they could have 
you know, traded for, you know, that's another thing. I look at the position groups and I'm like, they're looking a lot more solid than I thought they did at the beginning of the season. Like I would have a couple of weeks ago, I'd have been like, yeah, they need a pass rusher. They need a chase young. Mm -hmm. And and obviously anybody I think could benefit from one, but don't feel as desperate about that after watching Jonathan Grenard play the way he has the last couple of weeks, Mm -hmm. you know, and obviously Will Anderson is, is the investment that he is, you know, uh, they need a weapon. They need, they why not go get Devonte Adams? Obviously, Devonte Adams is better than anybody that they have on the team, but feel a lot better about Nico Collins and Tank Dell and 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 even Noah Brown. Hell, you know, uh, guys like that. So it's like there was a time where I would have felt like, hey, they needed to they need to, they need to address this position. I think now they just need to coach it better, play better, and keep developing. I think that that's perfectly fine. Like, yeah. I – obviously making a move could have made them better in the in the immediacy but i don't feel like i don't get the sense that they're playing for the that they are entirely playing for the immediacy for the right now our partners at ebay motors have teamed up with locked on fantasy football host Vinny Iyer to bring you some of the best fantasy picks each week all season long whether you're prepping for a daily draft or scouting the waiver wire, every week we're going to provide you players that are guaranteed to fit on your roster. So let's take a look and see who Vinny has picked out for us on this week's eBay Guaranteed Fit Fantasy Picks of the Week. Browns running back and my favorite pickup of the season because, boy, is he helping out my running back room, which is struggling. But now that Kareem Hunt has come back to the team and has been leaned on, with Nick Chubb injury for the long term, the Browns have really gave him the ball, and he's doing what I need for him to do. The Browns hit the win with the running game and the defense. Now, with the quarterback issues surrounding that offense, Kareem Hunt draws a fantastic matchup to run well in Week 9. The Browns are at home against the Cardinals, riding riding on a bad defense. and should be either a positive or or even game script to make sure that they they can stick with the running game with Kareem Hunt. Hunt has a good chance to put together a big game, leading the Cleveland Browns to a dub Sunday. And boy, again, am I hoping he does that. Vinny Iyer from Locked On Fantasy Football is going to help you win your fantasy championship. And eBay Motors knows a championship team is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you can make sure your ride stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, roof rack bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time, or your money back. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. eBay Guarantee Fit, only available to U.S. customers. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to this Wednesday installment of Locked On Texans. B. Scott, I don't know about you, but anytime there's an end goal for myself, I have many checkpoints I would like to hit. And I do the same thing in journalism, especially covering the rebuild of the Houston Rockets and the Houston Texans. And with yesterday's trade deadline being very, very quiet, I said to myself, that's another checkpoint that the Houston Texans have hit in their rebuilding process. Because remember, this time last year, Brandon Cooks had us running around because he wanted to get traded. They didn't trade it. They didn't trade him. Then he went ballistic on social media. Then he also had that Thursday night game against the Philadelphia Eagles. And it was just a fiasco covering this organization and just looking where they were then 365 days later. Shout out to the Houston Texans, man. They are finally getting it together and things are looking promising. B. Scott, when you look at Sunday's game, it was winnable. Um, but after the game, a lot of people, including us here on Locked on Texans, we did have some issues at how Bobby Sloat called the game, um, especially given given how much faith him and his staff has put in into their rushing attack, a rushing attack that has been up and down, a rushing attack that has been subpar, and a rushing attack that has not been 
good through the first six, seven games of the season. B. Scott, in your opinion, what, how do you think the Texans should utilize their offense moving forward? Because I said this on yesterday, and I'm going to repeat it again. Going into the season, it made sense as to why Bobby Sloyd, Coach D'Amico Ryans, wanted to be a run team. He was going out there with a rookie quarterback, and we all know a rookie quarterback, especially through those first couple of games, it can be rough on him. Just take a look at what was going on in Carolina. However, I think the success that we have seen out of C.J. Stroud should be an indication that even though we want it to be a run-heavy team, we have a quarterback that can definitely go out there that we can trust to go out there and put the ball in his hands. That way we can execute our offense. And the one thing that I keep looking at, I go back to the game against the Indianapolis Colts in the second half. I go back to the game against the Jacksonville Jaguars, Pittsburgh Steelers, the New Orleans Saints. Those were the games where they put the ball in CJ Stroud's hand and we saw the offense looked really good. However, there's been moments as you see, they put, I guess, in my opinion, too much faith into their Russian attack, a subpar Russian attack. And it's like, man, you let not one, but two games get by you that you could have won. Yeah, man, I, I agree that they need to put the ball in C.J. Stroud's hands more. Like, it's not even a question of, uh, about it. I imagine that Bobby Sloick, you would you would hope that coming out of a bye week, I think that's the most disappointing part about it for me. Cody is that coming out of a bye week you would hope that there would be a little bit better of, of a plan and a little bit better of a grasp for who you are as an offense at that point I know it's an early bye week but you get that the, the whole point is you get the extra time to self-scout self-evaluate and to come out with something that shows that you self-scouted and self-evaluated hmm. and and then to come out and to not exactly look like that to be like, well, you know what? We are still a run team or we are going to be more of a balanced offense. Like, yeah, you don't want – it's a balance of like <laughs> what are we trying to achieve with this balance? Do we want balance just for the sake of balance or like are we actually, you know, doing something that's complementary to the other? You know, and so – so often now it feels like, and this is because the run game is just not good and they continue to do it. And, and I feel like you do have to continue to do it to some degree, but now it just feels like they're trying to be balanced for the sake of being balanced because you're mm -hmm. like, Hey, why, why are you running that play? You, you, you don't run, you don't run the ball very well. Why what, another run play? But I think the big thing is, and this is the thing that Bobby Sloak is going to have to reckon with because everybody can see it. It's not, I mean, these are the type of numbers that people can pull up. And I saw it be a conversation piece on, on Twitter on Monday and Tuesday, uh, specifically Tuesday, that on early downs, on first and second down, nobody, nobody runs the ball more <laughs> than the Texans other than the, the Arizona Cardinals. Like they're next to la they're next to last or next to the top, depending on how you look at it, in terms of teams that run the ball on first and second down, and they're doing that with a quarterback like you would like Arizona. That makes sense. They haven't really had much of, much to speak of at quarterback, right? They've been trying to figure mm -hmm. it out with Dobbs, and you know Kyler's been out, and who knows if how much they were even trying to begin with. But that makes sense for them. For the Texans, it maybe it made sense for the Texans, like you said, earlier in the season when you didn't really necessarily know what to expect from CJ and maybe you had higher expectations for Damian Pierce than you do now at this point. And so, but but again, I go back to the self-scouting. Now you do know that CJ can carry an offense or at least can carry more on his shoulders than perhaps your typical rookie could. And now you do know that Damian Pierce is – not necessarily the the runner for this scheme or hasn't necessarily adjusted to this scheme the way you would hope he has. And, it's, and there's still time for that. It just hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And you do know that Devin Singletary has got some really good qualities about him. But, I mean, the best thing – I mean, I just named off three players, and I think we would all agree that the best one that I named off there was C.J. Stroud. So put the ball in C.J. Stroud's hands. Stop being one of these teams that run the ball the most on first second down. Stop developing tendencies like that that are a telltale. 
you know, I, I think that that was something that was also disappointing was that, hey, it looked like Carolina had a good beat on what the Texans wanted to do. Mm-hmm. And, and I know it was a bye week for them, too, and they get paid to scout and the coaches get over there, get paid as well. And players over there get paid. But, man, that was just disappointing to see. Had to be disappointing to see. It's like, you know, you got this time to prepare and you don't know who you, and you still don't really know who you are. Now, I will say to be critical. OK, we're talking about put the ball in CJ hands, put the ball in CJ Stroud hands, all of that. Well, we know the running game wasn't good. hasn't been good for a while. But CJ, I would say, played maybe his worst game so far in that game. Like he missed the deep shot to Nico Collins. You got to hit that. Like mm-hmm. you're talking about you want to be a more explosive offense and you want the trust from the coaches and all of that, like he did say after the game. But, hey, man, that's that's part of it right there. You got to hit that shot when you get it because you're not going to get a ton of them to begin with. And then all those batted balls that he had, like he's got to take some ownership of that. And you can look at that and say, okay, well, look, play caller wasn't great. The running game wasn't great, but the quarterback wasn't great either on Sunday. And so it's like, <laughs> it's like, hey, man, I, don't, I wouldn't say just trash it because you do have to look at the film and self-scout and self-evaluate and all of that kind of stuff. But, uh, but, but the answer does clearly seem to be to put the ball in C.J. Stroud's hands and then you sink or swim from there. You shouldn't have to worry when buying tickets to your next big event. Game time is the fastest and easiest way to buy all tickets for all events, including sports, theater, music, and comedy near you. With killer last-minute deals, all-in prices, views from your seat, which is my best, my favorite feature, and their best price guarantee, game time takes the guesswork out of buying Tickets. So now you ain't got to stress about what I'm gonna do, how I'm gonna get there, what I, where, 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 where I'm sitting. Just go to Game Time the app. You got the last minute ticket deals, flash deals, the uh, zone deals. It's easy to find and buy tickets for every kind of event in your area. Lowest price guarantee, event cancellation protection, job loss protection as well. They're making it easy for you to come shop. Tap in right now. Download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code Locked On NFL. With twenty dollars off your first purchase, terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code L O C K E D N F L. Y'all know N F L for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back in, ladies and gentlemen, to Locked On Texans. Um, later on today, depending on when you hear this podcast, B. Scott and myself will be out there at the Houston Texans practice facility taking notes on who's going to be out there on the field, who was called up from injured reserve, which players are absent, you know, the whole nine yards. You guys know by now. It's Wednesday, the first week. A practice for the Houston Texans as they prepare to take on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. B. Scott, Houston Texans, they are three and four. They're 10 games left into the season. I know going into the bye week, especially considering how the way they beat two of the top seven defensive teams in the league, the Pittsburgh Steelers and the New Orleans Saints. There was a lot of hope and promise and expectations that they could make a run to the playoffs. Some people say the division. Uh, my co-host John, he said division. <laughs> I didn't want to go far as division because even though they beat Jacksonville, I still consider Jacksonville the best team in, the, in this division. I was on board with they're definitely going to make a push for the playoffs. I think the most disappointing, well, one of the most disappointing things about the loss against the Carolina Panthers, it kind of brought a lot of us back to reality that, like I mentioned at the start of this show, this is still a team that is still in the early stages of this rebuild, regardless of, of how well things look through the first six, seven games of the season. B. Scott, what do you think the realistic output outlook should be for this organization moving forward? Yeah, man, and that's what I said this game was. The Panthers game, I said, hey, this one is even more important in some ways, even to me at the time, even more of a must win than the Saints game. I remember us having this discussion on Sports Radio 610 on the air. I think I was on In the Loop when we were talking about this, like this idea. I think they had the idea that the Saints game was a must win game, and I was saying, no, like – they can lose this game and still survive it. I don't think people are actually even expecting them to win, especially how people thought of the Saints mm-hmm. at that time. But mm-hmm. to me, it, it, to me, if they won the game, which they did, that 
would sort of not change the narrative, but change the narrative, but extend this belief and this thought that, hey, they could be this or they could be that. And so I thought winning was going to be much bigger than losing would have been in that game. And then they turned out to win it. To me, in this Panthers game, losing was going to be a lot bigger than winning because now we expect you to win. Mm -hmm. The Panthers have turned into and, and have become the worst team in the league because they were the only team to not have won a game up until that point. And then you're on the upswing. And so the expectation is a team like that, you know, the C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young battle aside, like just where the Texans are and where the Panthers are, the expectation is you go on the road, especially coming out of a bye week, and you go beat them. So to not do that, if you lose that game, now we got to reel it back. Now we got to pull it back a little bit and temper the expectations a little bit and start to be a little bit more understanding and realistic about where this team is. Like it's not an awful team, but it's also not a great team yet. Just because they beat the, the they beat the breaks off the Steelers and handle business against the, the Saints does not – crown you does not anoint you and they did beat the jaguars on the road that's probably their most impressive win mm -hmm. now that you look at it in retrospect that doesn't quite anoint you i mean in, in proper context the texans have been beating up on the jaguars no matter who was good or wasn't <laughs> good since the beginning of time it feels like so i mean i, I will remind people you know tyrod taylor and david cully beat the jaguars you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lovey Lovey Smith and Davis Mills beat the Jaguars, and I'm not saying that just to clown them. I'm just saying like it's a it's a thing. It's a thing that happens, and so uh, I, I do think that you got tempered expectations. I, I I gave that whole spiel just to say I was somebody myself that was like, why not be better than the Jaguars? Who says mm -hmm. the Jaguars got to be the best team in the AFC South? And why not this team? This team is new. We don't know as much about it. Maybe it is just a lot better than any of us thought or could ever give it credit for uh, going into it. But, yeah, I, I still look at the outlook for this team as one that can compete for a wild card spot. Um, and, and who knows what happens with the Jaguars. The league is just so weird, so fickle. Uh, parity, I think, is at an all-time high this year. I wouldn't say all-time, but it, it is especially – parity is a big thing in the NFL to begin with. Mm -hmm. But it is especially noticeable this year where you've got – Man, Cody, you've probably got your top, let's call them three or four teams in all of football, and then you probably got your bottom two or three teams in all of football, and then everybody else is just somewhere sandwiched in between trying to get in where they fit in, and I think the Texans are true. one of those. I think the Texans are one of those, and that's an improvement, man. Like You talk about what we were saying a year ago this time at the trade deadline, and a year ago before that, and a year before that. You know, uh, you know, when Will Fuller was still on the team and Deshaun mm -hmm. Watson was talking about, man, they not trading Will or they not trading whoever. I like, remember that. <laughs> it's been that way every year because it's like, yo, these guys, the, the, the good players on this team deserve better than this. They deserve to be on a team that's, that's worthwhile. And so the the cool thing about the outlook is that the players are worth the players that are worthwhile on the team can actually say that they are on a team that is worthwhile so i i look forward to the rest of the season man i'm not saying that they're going to go out there and take a wild card spot and but here, here's my expectation to be competitive in every game as they have been up until this point like i i think mm -hmm. the i think the 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 first two games aside the ravens game really aside and then of course what happened in that Colts game the first game they lost the lead or, I mean, they were down 14 to nothing before you could say go. But yeah. for the most part, man, and even after that, I thought they were kind of they, – they felt competitive after they got in that hole, right? So, like, what they have been for the, the vast majority of the season is competitive at every waking moment, uh, even in defeat, and I expect that to continue. Hmm. I 100% agree with you, B. Scott. I think we're definitely going to just see this team just – continue to grow and develop and that's just not for the players that's for the coaching staff too you know look Bobby Sloyd did not look great with the game that he called against the Carolina Panthers however I would like to remind everybody and this is something that I said when he got hired this is something that I said during training camp and OTAs um, this is something I said in preseason you got to keep in mind Bobby Sloyd is still in the learning development stages himself because this is his first real shot his first 
job as a team offensive coordinator. So he got a lot of learning and development to do as well. And for me, I'm, I I don't want to go down the list and say the Texans can win this game, the Texans can win that game. But what I would say throughout these final 10 games, they're definitely going to be competitive and they're definitely going to probably steal a couple games where we think to ourselves, man, the Houston Texans are definitely a better team than they have been over the last two years. You already mentioned his name. Shout out to my guy, David Cully, because he beat the Jacksonville Jaguars not once, but twice, Jerome. <laughs> Man, hey, hey, I, I'm, I am, I really hope, let's not explain that. Let's let the joke sit. But I really hope that there are listeners, viewers, <laughs> And people in this audience that understand why you just called me Jerome, because it is the funniest. It is it is one of the funniest things to happen. I would have to figure like in a long time in uh in, in, within our Texans media circle, mm -hmm. and, and for and for me, it's obviously high up there. Maybe the funniest thing to happen <laughs> since I've been covering the team. All right, all right. Look, I'm, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let the listeners and viewers, you know, hit B Scott up, hit myself up if you know why I called him Jerome. And the next time, next week, when we have you on the show again, I will share the story as to why I called you Jerome. <laughs> But shout out to my boy, David Cully. That's going to conclude this latest installment of Locked on Texans. As always, I'm your host, Cody M. Davis. Please remember to follow me on Twitter at Cody Davis underscore 24. Once again, that's Cody, C-O-T-Y, D-A-V-I-S underscore 24. B. Scott, where can our listeners follow you at on all your social media platforms and where they can find all of your work? At Brandon K. Scott on X, I guess it is. I'm still X, calling it Twitter. Twitter. Who knows? But you can you can find me there at B. Scott from Hiram Clark on Instagram. And, of course, Sports Radio 610s, all of their digital properties, man. You know, we're streaming now live on YouTube and Twitch. That's something that I help put together. So we're real proud of that. And, of course, you know, I'm, I'm in the mix on there on Wednesdays and Thursdays. You can find me on Wednesdays on the drive at 440. Find mm -hmm. me on In The Loop at 11 a.m., unless noted otherwise, of course. Sometimes we had some things going on. Last week we had the Dusty Baker press conference push me back a little bit. But stay tuned, man. You can find me pretty much anywhere. H-Town Who's Podcast with Adam Spillane, which I'm about to go handle it up right now. We're covering mm -hmm. this, these Rockets. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that, hey, that's our, that's our other uh, alternate universe, Cody, yeah, where, we, know, where right? we also find ourselves, where we also meet. So, uh, so a lot to <laughs> a lot to get active with, man. A lot to get active with around here. Now, put it like this: um, the Houston Texans have taken forward in their rebuilding project. That team that's playing inside Toyota Center, I don't really know right now, man. I know it's still early, but some some may right as of right now. You know, some may right, and some of the stuff still look the same. But until next time, ladies and gentlemen, peace.